Hi, good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to our next session of our Nexus and GP webinar series. Uh, welcome everybody back again. So today we're going to be uh, talking about the hepatobiliary topic. We're talking about gallstones and the uh, 2018 Tokyo guidelines. So just to start off with and uh, have a bit of ground rules, uh, don't worry about submitting your uh, MCR number. We have that already on record from your registration. So we'll be submitting uh, for <coughs> the CME points at SMC. This has also been already approved uh, for College of Family Physicians. Uh, and uh, we are going to get uh, one FM call points for all registrants for this meeting. So without further ado, just a quick introduction. Today's speaker is uh, Dr. Ho Chun Kiet. He's a general surgeon at uh, Mount Elizabeth uh, Hospital, Mount Elizabeth Novena, Parkway East and Mount Alvernia. A, we, he's a surgeon with 20 years of experience in the field, including in uh, digestive tract surgery, cancer surgery, hepatobiliary and pancreatic surgery. So he's a graduate from NUS in 1994. And uh, after graduation, he trained as a general surgeon in Tan Tok Seng Hospital and uh, has been admitted to a fellow of a Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh and Glasgow in 1999. He did his HMDP training uh, uh, in hepatobiliary and pancreatic surgery in Heidelberg, Germany. And uh, prior to his uh, private practice, he was a consultant in Department of Surgery Tan Tok Seng Hospital, as well as the director of the endoscopy center there. So without further ado, let me pass the time on to Dr. Ho Chun Kiet. Um, hi, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining me in, the, in this series of uh, Nexus uh, webinar. Uh, today, I shall be sharing uh, with you on a disease that uh, I think is very common and I'm sure uh, every one of you would have encountered patients with this uh, condition uh, in your clinical practice. Uh, if my voice is too soft or too loud, uh, by all means, please uh, text the uh, host so that uh, I can make the necessary adjustment. So without further ado, let me just uh, pull up my um, slideshow. All right, um, as mentioned, I shall be talking uh, today on gallstones and in particular, I shall focus on um, uh, uh, the complications of gallstone disease, namely acute cholecystitis and cholangitis and how one may recognize the, the disease, triage them, and then uh, plan your management uh, accordingly. Now, uh, Chiwei has very kindly introduced me. Uh, as mentioned, uh, I'm, a, uh, consult I'm a general surgeon with a special interest in hepatobiliary surgery. Uh, I graduated from the class of 94. Uh, if there are any of my classmates in the audience, uh, a shout out to you, All right? And, uh, early uh, New Year greetings to you also. Um, you can say that I'm a Tan Tok Seng boy. I, I started my surgical training and end my surgical training in uh, Tan Tok Seng Hospital uh, from MO to registrar to consultant. Uh, my boss then was uh, Prof Lau. Uh, he was also my mentor. Since 2010, about maybe 11 years ago, uh, I joined a few of my colleagues and we started a general surgical private practice because each of us have different subspecialty, we're able to offer the uh, full suite of a comprehensive surgical service under the umbrella of general surgery. Now, this is scope of my talk today. Um, I shall give a, a, a quick overview of uh, gallstone disease, and then I shall uh, touch a bit on the Tokyo guidelines to 2018. I shall give you some examples of how I apply the Tokyo guidelines in my practice, and then distill some of the guidelines that is practical for uh, GPs and a family physician like yourself. And then hopefully we have some time for question and answer. All right. Okay, let's uh, begin with the overview. Uh, let's begin with natural history. So gallstone is very uh, common in the population. Uh, but in this landmark paper published in 1982, where they look at the uh, natural history of gallstones, they are detected on screening. And these were silent gallstone, as in the patients did not suffer by any symptoms. And they followed these patients and they developed and they found that uh, such patients only develop symptoms at 2% per year for the first five years. 
And none of these patients will develop complications like acute cholecystitis or cholangitis before the onset of typical mild symptoms. Most studies uh, support that uh, only about 1% to 4% of asymptomatic patients would develop symptoms per year. And we extrapolate this, uh, this trajectory, two-thirds of patients with uh, asymptomatic gallstones remain asymptomatic after 20 years. And therefore, we do not uh, offer surgery uh, to, to such patients because for all you know, this asymptomatic patient in front of you may never have symptoms for the rest of his uh, adult life. Some of the common symptoms as uh, described in textbooks are fatty dyspepsia, which is uh, epigastric pain or discomfort after a uh, oily meal or fatty meal. Uh, you develop uh, upper abdominal bloating after food. Uh, the patient may feel a sense of indigestion, like the food is stuck in the stomach uh, after his meal. And that's not because he took a large quantity of food, like in, as in a buffet, even a normal quantity of food, he felt he will have this sensation of indigestion. Uh, and uh, if such symptoms are ignored, the patient may progress to a biliary colic where they have intense, severe cramp-like pain, usually in the epigastrium or in the right hypochondrium. And such pain may radiate to the right shoulder the patient may also experience cold sweats and nausea. The key thing to note here is that symptoms uh, occur after food. Some of them may have atypical symptoms. They may present with uh, reflux-like symptoms. Um, they may also experience runs to the toilet uh, after an oily meal, or they may even uh, present with chest pain that have been mistaken for a myocardial event. Uh, there was a recent patient who was admitted uh, with left-sided abdominal pain and chest pain under the cardiologist. Uh, she was taught to have a cardiac event. She went on to have an angiogram and, and even a, a stenting was done for, for a particular coronary vessel because the cardiologist found a narrowing there. And so they thought that the problem was uh, solved and she was discharged the next day. But the same night, she returned to the a and &E, uh, with worsening abdominal pain and subsequent investigation found uh, that she actually had acute cholecystitis. So sometimes patients can present in an atypical manner. I'd just like to get uh, do a poll now to just get a sensing of your practice philosophy. I'd like to, you to participate in this poll so as to allow me to know what is your preference right, when you approach a patient whom you see for the first time with uh, epigastric pain uh, and bloatedness after eating. There's no right or wrong answer. It's just a gauge of your preference. Uh, Chiwe, can you launch the poll? Uh, Okay, we'll give it another five uh, more seconds and we'll just collate the rest of the feedback and uh, maybe we'll close the poll in a short while. And these are the results of the poll. Okay, thanks, Chiwe. So you can see from uh, this poll, majority of you would uh, treat it uh, uh, as for a gastric problem first and start uh, empirical treatment with uh, gastric medication like proton pump inhibitors for mortidine or antacid. Yeah, that is uh, in line with uh, um, my experience in managing patients that I see referred from uh, family practitioner or general practitioners. Right, I, I find it a bit uh, of a concern that none of you will refer a general surgeon for gastroscopy, but anyway, that's a, another issue altogether. Uh, let me just close the poll. Right. So in terms of diagnosing um, uh, gallstones, the ideal test is actually the ultrasound. It is cheap, it has no radiation, uh, and uh, it is not invasive at all. As you, as you know, only 10% of gallstones are radio opaque. So if you were to use x-ray or even expensive tests like CT scan, 
uh, most gallstones will not be will not be seen. In terms of definitive treatment for gallstones, and I'm talking about patients with symptoms, uh, there's only one. It makes things very simple, which is cholecystectomy. Many patients will ask me, can gallstones be treated with medication? I, uh, this is a very often question that I, uh, I ask or was asked by my patients. Uh, so here's the answer. There is indeed a drug in the market called Ursofoc, which is also the oxycholic acid. And its function is uh, its, its uh, ability is that it increase biliary cholesterol saturation. Uh, this drug was first isolated from the bowel of the Chinese black bear. So there, there is some basis for this Chinese uh, uh, traditional medicine practitioners from harvesting the bowel of the black bear. So the, this drug can actually cause dissolution of cholesterol stones. However, they found that the stones should also be small, less than 2 cm. So for pure cholesterol stones and size of less than 2 cm, such a drug can cause a dissolution, dissolution rate of about 1 mm decrease per month. The dosage is 250 milligram three times a day, and you should try to take it for at least six months. If there's no change of the stone by six months, it's unlikely to work. However, having once you stop the drug, uh, studies have found that it's a high recurrence rate, about 30 to 50% at five years. It is not cheap. The drug costs about $3.26 uh, per capsule. Uh, this is sold in the uh, Mao E uh, pharmacy. So each box which comes at 100 capsule will cost you $326. And if you take it for a six months cost, that will burn a hole in the pocket for the, to the tune about $2,000. So you, I want you to know that this is only effective for pure cholesterol stones, which are stones predominant in the Caucasian population. For the Asian population like us, our stone type is mainly the pigment or mixed stones, and such a drug has little efficacy there. So basically for Asians like us, uh, this may be money poured down the drain. It, is, uh, quite, it has a quite a high uh, failure rate. What's the incidence of gallstones in Singapore then? In this very old paper published in 1970, they found uh, that uh, out of uh, about um, what 12,000 autopsies done, 398 uh, of them were found to have gallstones, giving a prevalence rate of 3%. And it confirms that most of the stones in Singapore are pigment and mixed stones, not the cholesterol stones. In more recent studies, uh, the prevalence rate ballpark figure is about 10% um, of adult population would have gallstones. But as I mentioned earlier, most of them have no symptoms. So therefore, it is a very common problem. Because of this, um, there is a, a uh, impulse for the international hepatopallary community, community to come out to with standardized guidelines on how to treat this disease uh, based on best available uh, medical evidence. So a international work group was formed uh, consisting of surgeons, gastroenterologists, emergency physicians, intensivists, ID physician, etc., all around the world. And their aim is to establish practical guidelines and management of complication of gallstone, namely cholecystitis and cholangitis. So the group will break up into small subgroups and they will plow through the medical literature and establish evidence-based guidelines through extensive uh, literature review. Where high-level evidence is lacking, then these groups will then come up with high-level consensus uh, through international experts. So they have been, uh, the first meeting of the Tokyo group was in 2006. They had another meeting in 2013 to update the guidelines. The most recent update was in 2018, and hence it's called the Tokyo Guidelines 2018. It's called Tokyo because this was started and initiated by a fund from the Japanese ministry, and the first uh, meeting was held in Tokyo. So let's come to how the guidelines uh, approach diagnosis. 
So when we come to uh, diagnosis, the guidelines uh, mention that you must fulfill uh, one item each from these three categories. All right. Uh, in the uh, in uh, Tokyo Guidelines 18, you can see that at the family practice level, which is uh, the GPs and family practitioners, you can probably arrive at a suspected diagnosis uh, since the features in the red boxes that I highlighted for you can be discerned by a general practitioner. If you have radiological uh, radiology facilities in your neighborhood, you can even get a definitive diagnosis by fulfilling the item in C, which is to get an ultrasound. So if you have patients with in whom you found Murphy sign or right hypochondrial pain or tenderness, and the patients have fever, you already can uh, have a suspected diagnosis of acute cholecystitis, right? And based on the guidelines, uh, Tokyo guidelines 2018. Um, in terms of radiological investigation, an ultrasound will suffice, but in here you see in a CT scan, you can see that uh, it's typified by a distended gallbladder. This haziness around the gallbladder indicates edema and the, the incriminating uh, uh, problem is the stone being lodged in the cystic duct of the gallbladder seen here. For cholangitis, uh, similarly at a, G, at a family practice level, you can also um, establish uh, the diagnosis. Uh, if you take a history and find that the patient has fever, chills, rigors, uh, pain, and you discern jaundice in a patient, you can uh, come up with a suspected diagnosis of acute cholangitis. Uh, probably at the GP level, uh, it may be hard to achieve uh, 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 category C, but sometimes if you have ordered an ultrasound, an ultrasound shows dilated bowel duts in the presence of fever, pain, and jaundice, you can also come up with a definitive diagnosis of cholangitis. Having made a diagnosis of acute cholecystitis or cholangitis, next you need to triage the patient to see how serious is infection. That would determine the next step uh, uh, of your management. So under the, the Tokyo guidelines, uh, there is a severity uh, grading uh, to help cl clinicians. There are three, basically three severity grades. Grade one denotes uh, mild inflammation well, grade three denotes severe inflammation uh, with end organ dysfunction, i.e. this patient is probably uh, uh, having um, septic shock. So for the clinician, do look out for features of septic shock like hot and flush peripheries, uh, hypotension or tachycardia, and there may be uh, end organ damage in the sense of uh, neurological, respiratory, renal dysfunction. So they may be confused or, or drowsy. They may look tachypnic uh, and they may have a low urine output. At the GP level, uh, certainly I'm, I'm sure you can discern hypotension, uh, tachycardia. You probably can also discern uh, neurological dysfunction. Grade two uh, will be a category between grade one and grade three. It just denotes a patient with a more serious infection but not amounting to a septic shock. So for acute cholecystitis, you may feel a tender mass in the upper uh, right upper quadrium, uh, right hypochondrium, or the duration of complaints uh, has been long. That means from onset of complaints, more than 72 hours have passed. This may denote a more uh, difficult uh, cholecystitis uh, and therefore more uh, difficult cholecystectomy. Similarly, for acute cholangitis, uh, there's also three, three categories of severity. Um, uh, grade one denotes mild inflammation, whereas grade three, uh, where there are features of septic shock. For grade two, uh, do look out for high fever, uh, more than 39 degrees Celsius. And uh, uh, elderly age is also a poor prognostic factor because uh, for cholangitis, a patient can easily slip into septic shock. And for elderly patients where their, their physiological reserve is lower, um, the outcome may be poorer. So look out for an elderly patient uh, with manifesting with a Charcot's triad of pain, fever, and jaundice. Now, in terms of treatment, uh, the Tokyo guidelines also come up with uh, certain uh, handles for clinicians. We start off with antibiotics. 
So antibiotics here refers to empirical antibiotics. That means antibiotics administered before you know the culture result and susceptibility results. And the aim of giving empirical antibiotics is to limit the systemic septic response and the local inflammation. So based on the uh, there are studies uh, looking at the international uh, papers published throughout the world. They found that E. coli is the most common uh, isolated organism followed by uh, Klebsiella species. So they, they look at the uh, um, antibiotic susceptibility of E. coli all around the world and they come up with this recommendation um, from, from uh, the uh, Tokyo Guidelines 2018. For grade one and grade two uh, infection, you may give empirical ciprofloxacin or levoflox or even keftriazone. But for grade three, because there may there are incidents, uh, incident, um, there's this issue with uh, pseudomonas species, you have to start uh, panems like imipanem or meropanem and piptazo or piptazo. Of course, uh, such antibodies may not be available in your practice. But ciprofloxx, levoflox, and keftriazone, I understand, uh, can be available in some of the family practice uh, clinics. For duration, for grade one and grade two uh, acute cholecystitis, you only need to give it until the gallbladder is removed. But for grade three acute cholecystitis and all grades of cholangitis, antibiotics have to be continued for four to seven days. In terms of definitive treatment, the the treatment for acute calculus cholecystitis is quite straightforward. You need to get the gallbladder out. The issue is more of timing. But for very sick patients where they are not possible to go under general anesthesia, then the aim is to drain the infected gallbladder until surgery is made possible when the patient is stabilized. So let me give you some perspective of uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy. It was first described in 1985. Uh, um, it was uh, quite a uh, big news in the surgical fraternity. But they also found that along with the introduction and widespread application of cholecystect laparoscopic cholecystectomy, there seemed to be an increased incidence of bowel duct injury. And indeed, in 1993, uh, international guidelines uh, around the world suggest that an acute cholecystitis was a relative contraindication for laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Rather, they would advocate interval or delayed cholecystectomy. They believe that the inflammation during the acute phase contributed to these increased rates of uh, uh, bowel duct injury. So the clinicians or surgeons were advised to delay the laparoscopic cholecystectomy till about six weeks later uh, and treat with antibiotics first. Should antibiotics fail to contain infection, then you do an open cholecystectomy. To avoid bowel duct injury, the hepatobiliary community has also established uh, certain surgical guidelines. And this states that any surgeon who attempts a laparoscopic cholecystectomy must first obtain the critical view before cutting any structures. What is the critical view? This involves lifting the gallbladder off the liver so that by opening this window, there should be only two structures crossing this window. One is the cystic artery and the other one is the cystic duct. Only after you establish such a view, can you then uh, avoid the issue of uh, injury to the common bowel duct. So this is uh, how uh, the surgery is conducted. At the start state, right, the Kellogg's triangle, which is over here, is covered by fat under an envelope of peritoneal lining. And the surgeon's aim is to dissect this area and lift the gallbladder off the liver in this area until you have this window that you see here. And in this window, this, this space between the gallbladder and the liver, there should only be two structures, the artery and the cystic duct. In so doing, you can safely avoid bowel duct injury. So let's conduct uh, another poll, right? Um, based on what I've mentioned just now, I'd like to now uh, get a poll to get your current understanding as to the optimum timing for laparoscopic cholecystectomy in the management of acute cholecystitis. Do you think uh, 
delayed or interval cholecystectomy is the optimum timing or early cholecystectomy is the early the optimum timing Okay, I think uh, most of the votes are in, so I'm going to end the polling now, and then we'll just share the results. Okay, so 70% of you feel that uh, delayed or interval cholecystectomy, uh, that means you treat antibiotics first and plan for surgery six weeks later, is the optimum uh, uh, timing for surgery in a patient with acute cholecystitis. Okay, let me share with you uh, what is the current uh, evidence let me close this poll first. Based on current evidence, the timing for laparoscopic cholecystectomy uh, is early laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And I, I say this because uh, um, uh, of the published data. There have been 17 randomized controlled trials, six meta-analysis, and three systematic reviews. And taken all together, there is very strong level one evidence to support early laparoscopic cholecystectomy as superior to delayed uh, uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy. In all these papers, they found that early cholecystectomy has no difference in bowel duct injury to delayed laparoscopic cholecystectomy. In fact, the hospital stay is shortened the overall cost of treatment is also lower. And in patients who, who were made to go through the option of delayed laparoscopic cholecystectomy, there is a risk of recurrent attacks of up to 30% during this six weeks uh, wait. Early cholecystectomy uh, can also be offered even if symptoms is last was more than 72 hours ago, up to one week. In the past, surgeons will say there's a golden 72 hours, but uh, as, as experience increased, uh, they found this 72 hours uh, golden hour not to be true anymore. It depends on the experience of the surgeon. So I hope I put to rest uh, what the evidence says regarding timing of surgery uh, for acute cholecystitis. Now, how does that marry with Tokyo guidelines? So in accordance with the, what they found from literature for grade one acute cholecystitis, aim for early laparoscopic cholecystectomy. For grade two and grade three uh, lap, uh, acute cholecystitis, we also aim for early laparoscopic cholecystectomy, but the authors uh, mentioned, and I quote and unquote, perform to be performed only at advanced centers where experienced surgeons practice. I guess that is most of the hospitals in Singapore anyway, because the advanced centers must have ICU and, uh, and the presence of interventional radiology services. If the patient is unfit for surgery, uh, as in the grade three uh, acute cholecystitis, stabilize the patient first, consider drainage, uh, which is a percutaneous cholecystostomy, where we insert a tube through the liver into the gallbladder under radiological guidance, suck out the bowel, decompress the gallbladder first, then stabilize the patient and then bring the patient to a theater as soon as possible. Or if not, then this subject this patient to a delayed laparoscopic cholecystectomy. In terms in for acute cholangitis, the principles for treatment uh, are, the, are as follows. And this is in order of priority. The first thing that we have to do is to decompress the biliary tree. Uh, just like we drain a, a abscess, decompress it of the pus in the same in the same manner, we want to decompress the biliary tree. Then it's done by either ERCP or PTC. The next priority is to remove the bowel duct stones, and that can be done in the same setting uh, if the patient is stable enough. The last thing in the order of priority is to remove the gallbladder. Again, for the very uh, well patient, that can be done in the same sitting, but for the patient who are more sick. The removal of gallbladder is usually uh, done at a later date. 
So how how does a Tokyo guideline then marry up with this uh, uh, principles of uh, treatment? The pillars are antibiotics and bowel duct drainage. For grade one cholangitis, usually they uh, we can send them for ERCP. And during the ERCP, where the endoscopist uh, decompress the biliary tree, they can also remove the stone at the same time. This can be a semi-elective procedure, as in, say, the diagnosis was made today, we can plan for it to be done tomorrow. It need not be rushed uh, as an emergency. And, and if the facilities allows and the patient is fit enough, laparoscopic cholecystectomy can even be done concurrently. There are cases where we do laparoscopic cholecystectomy or with on-table ERCP and removal of stone. So we settle the, the, the condition once and for all or one, at one setting. For grade two cholangitis, aim for early drainage, uh, either via ERCP or PTC. If the patient physiologically is stable, we can remove the bowel duct stone at the same setting if the patient condition allows. And we can even also offer cholecystectomy at the same sitting if the patient uh, uh, condition allows. Otherwise, we'll delay the bowel, bowel duct stone removal uh, to a later date. Just decompress the biliary tree with either a plastic stand or a generous sphincterotomy. For grade three cholangitis, these are patients with with uh, end organ dysfunction. Right, stabilize the patient first. Arrange for urgent drainage of the biliary tree either by ERCP or PTC. Very often, because of the respiratory compromise, we may find it hard to do a ERCP. We will usually arrange for PTC. We usually deal with the bowel duct stone at a later date. So how do we? How do I then apply the Tokyo guidelines in my day-to-day -day practice? So this is a patient that I manage over the New Year's Day. She's a 44-year-old lady. She was admitted uh, with epigastric pain of three days and fever of one day. Uh, she was tender the epigastrium and the total height was uh, elevated. We did the the admitting physician did a CT scan which diagnosed acute calculus cholecystitis. She was referred to me and uh, put her up for early laparoscopic cholecystectomy on New Year's Day, and she was discharged on the following day. And the histology uh, uh, confirmed acute on chronic cholecystitis. So in these pictures, the operative picture you see a very uh, distended gallbladder. The walls were edematous, but still we can identify what we call the critical uh, window or uh, critical view where I lift the gallbladder off the liver, giving this big window and that there, there should be only be two structures crossing it. I have already clipped and cut the artery and what's left is the cystic duct. This is a case of a grade three acute cholecystitis. She's a 68 year old lady. She has a background medical problem of hypertension. She was also a hep B carrier. She came in uh, for two days of uh, right hypochondrial pain and acute shortness of breath of one day duration. Uh, the right hypochondria was very tender. She was tachycardic, but not hypotensive yet uh, at the a &E. She was very, she was febrile. Uh, her saturation was uh, low at 92% at room air. She has a very elevated uh, white blood cell count of 33,000 and CT scan shows acute cholecystitis with gangrenous changes. We started empirical marrow panel. If you remember the Tokyo guidelines about uh, the choice of antibiotics of uh, empirical antibiotics, you should start the uh, panels because there may be pseudomonas uh, infection. But then we asked the anesthetist to see whether she's fit for general anesthesia. If she wasn't, I would arrange for a percutaneous cholecystostomy. But as an anesthetist opined that she was safe for general anesthesia. So we brought her in and did an emergency, uh, uh, emergency laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Intraoperatively, she has to be started on some inotropes. And you can see from this operative picture, this is what a gangrenous gallbladder look like. So even if we do a percutaneous cholecystostomy to temporize the, uh, uh, the treatment, I mean her condition, so to uh, so stabilize her, she will still need an early laparoscopic cholecystectomy, as you can see, because the gallbladder is dead. So post-op, she was kept intubated. Uh, and we managed to wean off the dopamine uh, at the second day and she stayed in ICU for about five days, mainly because of the respiratory compromise. She was subsequently discharged on post-op day eight. Uh, histology shows acute necrotizing uh, cholecystitis. 
Now, how about cholangitis? So I give you an example of a grade one acute cholangitis with cholecystitis. So she's a lady uh, with background history of hypertension and asthma. She presented right-sided abdominal pain, was tender, Murphy's was positive. Total white was mildly elevated, but her liver enzymes were all deranged. When we did the ultrasound, it shows gallstones with acute cholecystitis. The ultrasound also picked up a dilated common bowel duct and there were bowel duct stones seen. As you can see from her parameters, she's quite stable. So we arranged for an early laparoscopic cholecystectomy with on-table uh, cholangiogram and rendezvous ERCP. Right. What does, what does it mean? It means that during the, the laparoscopic cholecystectomy, I will guide a wire down the cystic duct into the common bowel duct. And then my endoscopist friend will catch his wire from below to assist his cannulation of the common bowel duct and remove the common bowel duct stones and decompress the, the, the bilirubin sheet at the same uh, sitting. And then I complete the cholecystectomy thereafter at the same time. So, so this is a, uh, a management of patient with mild uh, acute cholangitis and cholecystitis, great one. So what, what can you get out of uh, 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 Tokyo guidelines for the, for the GPs? So I, I distill some of the, what I call practical handles that you may, may want to use or consider for your practice for the Tokyo guidelines 2018. First, as you as the first poll mentioned, many of you will treat uh, patients uh, as for gastric pain first. Uh, that is not wrong. After all, uh, gastric problems are definitely more common in the community. However, a good proportion of these patients would have actually have gallstones. So, a proposed approach for the family physician in managing a patient whom you think is uh, uh, whom you think has gastric problem, but you cannot exclude uh, gallstones is to do this. First, get a good history, especially uh, the, the relationship of the complaints to meals, especially fatty meals. Get them to start a food diary. Meanwhile, you can start, uh, give a trial of empirical uh, proton pump inhibitors, for example, omeprazole. Give it for two weeks and tell the patient to come back after two weeks to see you because very often I see patients who after two weeks and because the symptoms did not get better, they would GP hop and go to the next GP who did not have um, uh, uh, the, uh, the understanding of a previous consult and they restart the treatment with another PPI. So do ask the patient to come back after two weeks. And if the symptoms remain the same or if there is a distinct relate, temporal relationship to fatty food, order an ultrasound. Sometimes you may pay, find patients with typical uh, biliary colic, right-sided pain after food, cold sweats, pain radiate to the uh, right shoulder. I see uh, uh, one of the favorite medication that GPs will give will be either tramadol, panadol, or bascopan. But in a, in a study done uh, on the uh, optimum analgesia in managing patients with biliary colic, they found that NSAIDs uh, is the superior drug because it not only can reduce the pain, it can prevent a uh, progression of the disease to acute cholecystitis. And this is born out of uh, many randomized control trials. And this paper sort of summarized all the randomized control down, uh, trial done, in, done in, the, the, uh, in the past. And they found that drugs like Sinflex, Ketorolac, uh, Indomitacin, Voltran, not only can reduce pain, but can reduce can can limit the progression of disease to acute cholecystitis. So do consider giving uh, NSAIDs rather than uh, bascopan if you diagnose a case of biliary colic. Unless of course a patient has allergy to NSAIDs or uh, has renal impairment or has a, a history of asthma. In managing acute cholecystitis or cholangitis, the first thing the GP should do is to assess the ABCs. Look out for features of septic shock, particularly tachycardia and hypotension. Look out for other features of end organ dysfunction, for example, acute shortness of breath, drowsiness, confusion. Um, if patients in pain do consider giving NSAIDs, you may start empirical antibiotics at your end, uh, like Ciprobe, uh, Levofloxacin, uh, Keftriazone. Uh, if it's a grade two uh, acute cholecystitis, 
uh, as in they have no end organ dysfunction, but you discern certain features that may uh, that make you suspect that infection may be a bit more serious. For example, a tender mass, a high fever, elderly age. Uh, you should send them to A and E immediately. For grade one, where it's the mild inflammation, you can send them to your favorite surgeon on the same day or the next day if the appointment can be made available. However, for grade three, where there's end organ dysfunction, uh, quickly set a line, start the drip and call the ambulance. Uh, so hopefully with this uh, summary, uh, it will help you in uh, managing a patient that you may encounter with acute cholecystitis or cholangitis. So with this, I'll end the talk and I'm happy to take a, a question that you may have. Uh, thanks, Junkit. That was a very comprehensive talk on uh, gallstones and uh, the complications from gallstones. Uh, we'll just wait for the participants uh, to see if they have any questions to ask. Uh, while we wait for that, maybe I'll start off the Q&A. Just to check, what do you think of the accuracy of bedside ultrasound in uh, diagnosing gallstones? Uh, I think some uh, GPs do have their own ultrasound machines, so do you think that's accurate enough to make a diagnosis? I, I, as I mentioned, ultrasound is the ideal uh, investigation or radiological modality to diagnose gallstones. But when we when we talk about ultrasound, we also always mention operator dependence. So if the operator is uh, uh, fairly experienced, yes, a basic ultrasound can diagnose a gallstone disease or even uh, acute cholecystitis. Uh, for gallstones, all you need to demonstrate is hyperechoic shadows with posterior acoustic shed, uh, shadowing uh, to make the diagnosis of uh, uh, gallstone. For acute cholecystitis, you have to demonstrate a very distended gallbladder. Uh, there is features of uh, um, pericholecystic edema, as in fluid around the gallbladder. And the uh, sonographic Murphy will be positive, as in when you press a probe into the right hypochondrium and ask the patient to take a deep breath, the patient will catch his breath uh, um, as he inspired because the gallbladder now uh, touches the, the ultrasound probe and he then stops breathing so as to reduce the pain. Okay. Uh, then. The other question, uh, maybe I'll uh, put forward. I, I mean, listening to this, obviously listening to the complications arising from cholangitis and the severity, obviously, um, this is a condition that needs to be seen by the specialist as soon as possible. Is there any situation in terms of a patient you suspect to have cholangitis that you would manage in an outpatient basis? No, um, cholangitis. In fact, even in acute cholecystitis uh, should be sent uh, to the hospital uh, at the earliest possible. Uh, as mentioned about cholangitis, uh, patient can pro progress to septic shock quite quickly, uh, even though the patient may appear to be fairly stable in front of you. So do get a patient to go to the hospital as soon as possible. In fact, grade two, you should ask the patient to go immediately by, by whatever means to the hospitals. Uh, for grade three, it should be uh, you should be the one calling the ambulance because patient has features of end organ dysfunction. Even for grade one, you should get them to see, be seen by your specialist friend. If you don't send them to A and E, at least get them seen by your specialist friend the same day or the next day. Okay, uh, there's a question from one of the GPs. Uh, he's asked, uh, "Is jaundice often a prominent feature of gallstones with cholecystitis?" When we say jaundice, uh, uh, there are two components. One is clinical jaundice. Then you can see uh, yellowing of the eyes, dark urine or pale stools. That is not common. That is not common. But when you look at liver function, then sometimes there may be mild hyperbilirubinemia uh, in some cases of acute cholecystitis. Uh, but that is usually a biochemical uh, problem, not, not, not due to a mechanical obstruction about that. Usually this uh, uh, um, elevation is very low, or it could be a situation where actually the patient has uh, a passage, spontaneous passage of stone. That means there was a stone jam in the cystic gut and this stone sl slipped into the bowel duct, but fortunately for the patient, it has passed spontaneously in duodenum. During that moment that it was in a, still in the bowel duct, it caused a, a, um, 
a period of transient hyperbilirubinemia. Uh, so in such patients, usually when we did ultrasound, the bowel ducts are normal size. And when we repeat the liver function test, uh, they normalize quite quickly. So sometimes when we are unsure in a hospital, we will either order a MRCP to see whether there's indeed any bowel duct stones, uh, or we do an intraoperative cholangiogram when we put a patient up for surgery. But in, in essence, for acute cholecystitis, uh, jaundice is not a prominent feature. Okay, thanks, Junket. Um, there's another question that's come in. Uh, asymptomatic gallstones picked up by ultrasound in a person who's going to work in a remote region. Do we do a prophylactic cholecystectomy? That's a okay, so, question. yeah. Um, if we use literature to, uh, to help us, right, uh, if this, if you have uh, hundreds of such patients who has a work in a remote region, out of this 100 patients, right, only 20 or 30 patients may develop symptoms uh, um, eventually. So if we were to do prophylactic cholecystectomy, we are actually sacrificing a gallbladder of 70 patients who may remain asymptomatic for the rest of their life. So in answer to this question is uh, uh, no. Um, fortunately, uh, for such patients, even if they do develop, and they usually start off as mild symptoms, it's not uh, acute. Uh, they do not, on the word go, uh, come in with acute cholecystitis or acute cholangitis. So for them, you just need to highlight that, look out for such symptoms and such symptoms, then try to arrange for uh, uh, um, a trip back to the home country or to an area where there's medical facility. Right. However, there are certain industry I know that will insist the patient uh, uh, go for um, a prophylactic cholecystectomy, mm -hmm. but that's a case by case uh, uh, basis. Like I've, I've done a prophylactic cholecystectomy for pilots before because their airline refused to allow them to fly and will ground them until they remove the gallbladder, even though they have no symptoms. Oh, really? Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, on the same vein, how about prophylactic appendicectomy? Yeah, same principle. It's, it's the same principle, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Chunket. That was a wonderful talk. It's a good um, update for, for us on the management of uh, gallstones. So we'll keep the uh, webinar open in case you have any further questions. Uh, do write in your questions and uh, we'll get back to you. We'll reply to you uh, on your email or directly. Uh, so just uh, drop us a note either in the Q&A or in the chat. All right. So we'll just keep this going for a short while uh, to see if anybody has any further questions. And uh, thank you everybody for attending our Nexus and GP webinar. So our next webinar will be on the 24th of February. Uh, where Dr. Jane Tan will be talking to us on a colorectal topic. So uh, I hope to see everybody back there again on the 24th of uh, February.